This evening, I'm happy to introduce our speaker tonight. Sergio Kwan is a visual artist who graduated with a BFA in art and design from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. He is a highly multidisciplinary artist. He has worked on a diverse range of projects across the globe, which include hotels and resorts, brand identity, consumer products, live events, and theme parks. He also has a passion for painting and horticulture alike. Early on, he realized that bonsai was the ideal synthesis of both. As a result, he became fascinated with bonsai as an art form. Although Sergio works on a variety of conifers, he has developed a particular interest and passion for a wide range of deciduous species, which includes maples, elms, and beech, among many others. In 2014, he built his bonsai garden in northern New Jersey, and we're going to be fortunate to see that tonight. Sergio believes that bonsai is a true art form that holds commonalities with painting, drawing, and sculpture. Although the artist is bound by the physical limitations of the plant material itself, bonsai can be effective vehicles for self-expression. But unlike other art forms, bonsai is alive and constantly evolving. The bonsai practice is an intimate and continued dialogue between artist and nature. This relationship gives bonsai its own unique dimension. Sergio also believes that one must allow for the tree to help guide us as we strive to evoke a clear and crystallized expression of nature in its most essential and simplest form. Sergio received the Best Deciduous Award at the U.S. National Bonsai Exhibit in 2014, amongst other awards as well. He also was illustrator for Bonsai Heresy by Michael Hagedorn. Without further ado, please sit back and enjoy this evening's program by Sergio Kwan. And uh, Sergio, I'm going to highlight you and looking forward to this. Thank you, Dodie. Thank you, Renee. And thanks. Uh, thank you for to the rest of you guys for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, be in front of you guys and uh, allow me to present some of my my work to you guys. Um, I will I have a, a presentation that is uh, sort of uh, section into three parts. The first part is going to be kind of like a quick overview of my garden. The middle part is going to be, I want to show you a progression um, of a few of, of the trees that I've worked on recently in my collection. And the last part um, sort of uh, dives a little more, more in detail, uh, more deeply into uh, bonsai techniques. Uh, they're, they're, they're case studies. I think I have four of them. Um, and as I go through, as I go dial through the, through, through the slides, please feel free to ask any questions. I like for this to be kind of more conversational rather than just me presenting and then you guys kind of waiting and, and asking. Um, so as I go, please don't, don't feel like you're interrupting. I, I, once again, I like for this to be as, as sort of uh, a, a com as conversational as, as possible. So I'm going to, with, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get the show on the road. Okay, share, all right. Okay, you guys should be seeing introduction. We already did. Thank you, Dodi, for the intro. And uh, like I said, the first part, I'm gonna give you guys an overview of uh, my garden, okay, which I built uh, back in 2014. My garden is nothing, uh, nothing huge or anything like that. It's certainly not a commercial nursery of any kind. It's more of a, I like to call it more of a boutique garden. Uh, but it's, I would say it's large enough to house some, some fairly uh, large trees, but not, nothing that is, I would say, is like this huge garden. Um, but in, in any case, uh, back in 2014, I built the garden. Uh, this structure that you see back, uh, let me, um, are you, do you guys see my, my cursor? Or yes. maybe not. Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, we can. I just want to make sure that you guys. Okay. So the the first thing that I built in my garden was the the uh, the shade structure, only because as um, again as you guys probably know already, I, I specialize more on deciduous uh, uh, species, 
Uh, I do work on some conifers, but for the most part, my, my garden is, is all deciduous uh, uh, species. So because of that, I needed to build some sort of uh, structure, shade structure, especially to shade some of the smaller trees uh, in the heat of uh, the summer. Uh, so that was the first uh, element in the garden that I built and everything sort of grew out of, out of that. Uh, so that's one shot that you're seeing there. All right. Okay, uh, so this is another view uh, of the garden. And again, um, you'll see how uh, I use uh, crushed stone for the, for the ground. Uh, I used to have grass, I remove all that stuff. Um, you'll notice my garden is not, definitely not, not at all a replica of a Japanese garden, but I did take some design sort of uh, inspiration, if you will, from some Japanese garden. So it's got a little bit of a Japanese flavor to it without trying to, uh, you know, I would say kind of mimic it or, or copy a Japanese garden per se. I think it's beautiful. More, feels a little more eclectic than anything else. Uh, you see here a variety of, uh, of deciduous uh, trees from a uh, maple to beech to a birch, more maples uh, in this area here. Another view of the garden. I have a few water features in the garden, a couple of them, since I couldn't have a koi pond, uh, only because I, I thought it would be uh, a lot of work to have a koi pond. It would have been beautiful. I love them, but, uh, but I, I think I had enough with just keeping my, my trees, uh, working on my trees. So I decided to, to hold on the koi pond and, and it had a smaller, uh, water features that you'll see. Uh, you'll see a close up of that in a few slides down. Another view, the opposite view, looking the other way of the garden. This is, I think, was taken in uh, early, very early June. Uh, here you see a large uh, uh, um, Japanese beach uh, forest that you will see uh, later on in the presentation. I have, um, I think there may be other close-ups. So that my benches are all painted in case you're wondering. I use uh, pressure treated wood and they're all painted. Now, to me, to my eye, it looks good. It looks really clean and makes the trees kind of pop. The problem with being painted surfaces, as you can imagine, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a pain because I have to repaint them every year, every two years. So it becomes um becomes kind of uh, more work for me actually but i i do i do like how clean the surfaces look painted rather than having just uh, bare wood this is a close-up of a water feature i have um uh, i plant uh, water lilies in in this uh in this little sort of uh, well they're not so little they're, they're actually pretty large water vessels and that's a, a nice sort of touch to the garden. In, this is a, what you're looking at is the center of the garden. I use some large boulders just to give you yeah. a little bit of a sense of size. This tree over, over here on the left-hand side, the one that I'm circling, is about four feet from the edge of the pot, just to give you a sense of a scale. So that's about four feet. Uh, this maple here, a little bit further away from us, is about three feet tall. And then you have uh, smaller trees uh, to the right. But that that's just gives you a bit of a sense of uh, the scale that we're, we're, we're looking at. What is that large tree on the right, on the left? It looks like a... This one right here? Yes. That's an elm. That's a Yatsubusa elm. Beautiful. You'll see, um, you'll see a, a better shot, a, a little closer shot, autumn color um, in, in a few slides down. Japanese red uh, pine in Bunjin style. Mm. That's one of my few uh, conifers actually. <laughs> this, this tree actually was, um, supposedly was collected in the some in some mountains of Japan when it was a small tree and somehow it made it to the US. I'm not sure how, but uh, it ended up here in the US, but this was originally collected in, in uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure where uh, exactly in Japan, but it was collected in the mountains. So it's a cool tree. This is a close up um, of uh, one of the water features that I have in the garden. These are miniature uh, water lilies. And forgive me, I can't remember this particular uh, species of water lily, but they're, they're perennials. Um, they, they go dormant in the winter and they come out again in the spring and they flower profusely uh, during the uh, July and, and August months. Very easy, very easy to keep uh, plants and very, very pretty. Uh, now switching a little bit over to like fall, you'll start seeing fall uh, pictures here. This is a picture actually, this, I took this picture just a few days ago. Just um, actually, no, this was maybe three weeks ago. Anyway, just catching the last rays of the sun as, it, as the sun was coming, coming uh, going down. And so, Joe, did you design yeah. uh, your garden yourself, the yes. landscaping and the hardscape? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I kind of composed it together as best as I could. And again, my my aim was to uh, make sure that I designed something that um, that kind of flowed, had a, a certain kind of logic to it, as you go through one area to the next. And uh, my main focus was hopefully. Uh, to highlight the highlight the uh, the bonsai trees, and everything else would just be secondary, basically. It's beautiful I, and very unique. Thank you. Another um, shot of in fall, and uh, this is in uh, in da dusk, and the trees. This is another recent shot that I took this fall, and the trees seem to kind of glow in that in that light. This is actually uh, here in the foreground, you see a church, large, fairly large chochubai that I was lucky enough to uh, purchase from, uh, from Michael Hagedorn, who is Mr. Chochubai. He's got some amazing, amazing uh, chochubais, probably some of the, I would say now probably the best chochubais in the US for sure. Oops, uh, okay, next one, another shot of it. And you can see I use a rain chain. So again, aspects of it, and I think you might have seen uh, a Japanese uh, bamboo uh, fountain. So I, I use Japanese elements in my garden, um, you know, but, but my aim was not trying to replicate a Japanese garden per se. My house is not, uh, as you can see by the, uh, by the wall is totally non-Japanese. So I needed to find a way to kind of blend the style of my home with with the um, with the garden itself. Uh, Jody, I believe you had asked me about that Yasubusa elm. This is a close up of it. Um, this was originally came from uh, Mirai, and uh, it's a very large tree. It's about four feet from the edge of the pot, and this is of course in fall. And it's just uh, a really, I have to say, a really really impressive tree that I'm, I have. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to uh, be able to, uh, you know, own and 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 hopefully um, progress it. Move Can it you forward. tell us what the pot? Who's the potter that oh, made that? Boy. Yes, that is an American potter by the name of um, Boy. Let me see if I remember. Um, ah, the name escapes me. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Um, but he's very, very, fairly well-known uh, potter, uh, American potter. Not, he's not Rang Lang, um, but, uh, but again, he's very large pot. He's, I think he was maybe 30 some inches wide, something like that. Uh, if I remember through the course of the presentation, I'll let you know, but uh, the, his name escapes me right now. Another view, uh, right in the center here, you see an Arakawa that you will see down later on in the presentation. And for the, uh, in case you're wondering, for materials that I've used, again, I've used uh, the, the painted uh, uh, benches are um, uh, uh, pressure treated wood, but then all for other, uh, what they call monkey poles, right? The, the single bonsai stands, the top of it is actually bluestone uh, pieces that I use. 
and the posts themselves are painted um, pressure treated wood as well. And you can see here the Japanese bamboo uh, fountain that I'm using. A, say, a Shohin Salkova. This, this actually picture was taken this year very recently. Another view. Shards Pygmy right down in the center. It's a, Shards Pygmy is a cultivar of Japanese maple and never fails. It's a very uh, reliable as far as autumn color. It's, it's incredible every year, no matter what, uh, what it is. It, it always uh, really uh, is a great performer in terms of color. Uh, other trees are, are, it's a little bit of, um, you know, uh, Sometimes they color up well, sometimes they don't so much, but Charles Pygmy, Pygmy is one of, the one, one of the ones that really color, colors up very, very well for me, as well as my Arakawa, really uh, every single year. Here it is, close above it, Ooh. and it's very intense. Arakawa, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but it's a really special cultivar of Japanese maple where you, I, I always say that you have everything with Arakawa. You have rough bark, right? A lot of character in that bark with the fine twigs and the beautiful Japanese maple leaves, color, everything. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful culture bar. And uh, of course, I just wanted to show you guys this just to get a good laugh because after autumn, we know in the Northeast what's coming and uh, we do have, uh, some very frigid winter sometimes. Uh, this is the exact same garden, of course, but uh, in the middle of winter and uh, the trees are all tucked away. Uh, nothing stays in the garden. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and here we're looking at, I think this picture was taken last, last winter and I had about a foot and a half of snow at, the, at that time when I, when I shot this picture. So it was a winter wonderland. <laughs> Uh, I think this actually concludes this first part of the um, of the presentation. So I don't know if you guys have any questions before I jump into the uh, tree progression. Yes, sir. Oh, go ahead. Where do you put your trees in the winter? Yeah, good question. So uh, I have uh, I don't have it right now, but uh, greenhouses in the works. But right now I have a sort of like an unheated unheated garage space that I just put all my trees in there for the winter. And so they don't uh, need sun? They, well, here's the thing. Uh, and I think that there is some, I don't know if there's actual evidence, but there's a lot of talks about even deciduous trees, even though they don't have any leaves that they, even through the, through the bark, they absorb the UV uh, rays from the sun, et cetera, et cetera, that is beneficial for them. Uh, so it's all that talk, right? And I'm not a plant scientist, so I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that that's all perhaps true. But all to say that for, for me, I saw them in very, very low light and uh, they do fine. They do fine. Uh, I've, done, I'm that, I've done this for many years and uh, with no problems whatsoever. Now, I don't know exactly what the benefit is about you know, getting them some real light during the winter. Uh, but I know that mines are, are you know, near dark and, uh, and uh, no, no problems whatsoever uh, come springtime. Can you please spell the, <clears throat> the tree you called Chochubai? Yes. Okay. It is uh, C-H-O-J-U-B-A-I. Thank you. Yeah. All right. What time of year do you bring the plants back out? Uh, it becomes a little dicey. That's a great question. Uh, around March, it becomes, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of the term bonsai shuffle. What happens is I, I need to start bringing in trees out during the day and back in during the night because they're starting to kind of, the, you know, the buds are starting to push, right? So they're gonna start leaning light. So I put them out in the daytime. And uh, during, the, you know, sometimes in March, we have days where it's maybe, you know, uh, in the 40s. So I took them out. And uh, but then what happens is at night, it goes down to like, you know, the 20s, sometimes even the teens. 
So uh, I have to bring them in. So it becomes a little bit that that time becomes a little dicey, a little bit of like this back and forth kind of kind of thing. And then finally, around I would say uh, beginning uh, middle to April, I would say middle April is say fairly safe to kind of start bringing them bring everything outside into the garden. But we can get we can still get in mid mid April here. We can still get your your sort of surprise freeze at night. So have to be very mindful of that um, because you certainly do not want to expose your tree, something that is pushing growth in, in, a, in a, you know, freezing weather. Okay, I'm going to jump to the next section, which is uh, I'm going to show you guys a sampling of my work. And uh, this is, uh, this, these are trees that I've, been developing recently, and I, I will show you their progression through uh, several years. Some of them have progressed quicker than others, but uh, I will show you that. And the first one is uh, the Arakawa that you guys just saw, uh, saw a moment ago. And this is the tree about a year after I purchased this. I, I purchased this through uh, eBay. <laughs> this was, mm, oh my gosh, I think this was 2011 or something like that. So this was a year after I purchased the, the tree. And um, I grew that previous year, I grew these long shoots that you see up on the top because I anticipated that I would need at least one, if not more uh, graphs, whether they will be approach graphs or thread graphs. Um, so that's what the tree looked like. And this actually, I took this picture right before I uh, worked on it. I styled it, and you'll see that in a second. And this is the tree after I had um, sort of set the, the general structure or reset the general structure. Um, you would notice that, uh, and my new front is, you know, with the chopstick, you will notice that I rotated the, the pot slightly bit. And again, bonsai many times is about not only about the big decisions, but about the nuances and the in, and, and the um, you know small details. Uh, and the reason why I rotated that is to push one of the trunks, in this case, a small trunk, a little further to the back, because if I'm going to go back to the uh, to the previous picture, that uh, originally proposed front had the two trunks parallel to the viewer, and uh, always you want to have. Uh, whether it's a multi-trunk tree or, you know, uh, I think mostly a multi-trunk tree, you always want to shift your, your uh, composition just a little bit uh, one way or, or the other to kind of add a little bit of directionality to your design. And that's what I did here. Uh, you also notice how I had sort of designed my branches and not every branch is designed the same way. Notice this one here, how it kind of just goes up and then down. Um, Usually, uh, when you're designing your, your pads for the seizures, um, you don't want to have, imagine your hand extended out and looking at your hand from, you know, from the side view. So all you will see is just one straight line. You never want to have that with the seizures um, uh, branching uh, or structure. You always want to have, want to see all your fingers from the side. Uh, you, so in the same manner in, in, uh, in your trees, you always want to see all your ramification, ramification from the front. Um, you also notice uh, just this uh, loop up here, and that's a, a approach graph that I had to do. Uh, what happened to this tree is when it was shipped to me, the very top, the original apex that actually went straight up, it broke. Um, so that created uh, sort of a problem for me. And so what I did was I bent one of the side branches, um, original side branches up to form my new future apex. That created an outside curve here um, where mm -hmm. I needed, I just sort of needed uh, to place a branch there, a future branch there. This is a tree about, I think uh, a couple of years after the previous picture. Um, and unfortunately, what happened was that thread graft that I should show you, not sorry, not thread graft, uh, approach graft, um, when I was transporting the tree from one place to the other, uh, unfortunately, that snapped. 
and I had to restart my approach graph. So this is actually, it sent me back a, a year, a whole year. So I had to restart that, that um, approach graph. And this is what you're seeing here. Can I ask and a question it, here? Of course, please, please do. Yes, uh, uh, why did you use an approach graph rather than, than a thread graph? Okay, so it, I think it depends on the location of where you wanna place the branch. Um, I, my preference usually is to do thread graphs only because I feel like you are likely to have more success with a thread graph over an approach graph. Sometimes with approach graphs, uh, either the tree will reject it uh, or if it's successful, uh, in my opinion, many times I see uh, approach graphs where the exit point of that branch looks a little bit odd to me. It doesn't look quite right. Um, whereas with a thread graph, I think the result, um, I think is much more satisfactory um, than, than an approach, uh, approach graph. In this case, uh, I just did an approach graph because it just laid right on top of that curve right there. So I did not need to do a, a, a thread graph. For me, it was just laying that, doing a little bit of a groove right on the top of that, of that cut and just laying that branch right there. So it kind of really worked perfectly for that specific location. So that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, you will also notice on the lower right hand side what you know this uh, uh, sh you know whip here that I've um, that that is going there uh, originally was a root graft, but what happened was that I sort of fell in love with it, and I thought to kind of keep developing that as a, a little bit of a third trunk, almost as an accent little tree down there. Um, that root graft was taken from a, an air layer from, this, from the tree, because otherwise if it had been from an Arakawa of another tree, I would have most likely end up with different sort of um, color, basically. Uh, certainly I think in autumn color, they would, have, they would have looked a little bit different. Um, you will see um, the, the, the interesting thing about this Arakawa, and you will see that in a few slides down, is that it has more of a red, really red color in spring. Uh, most Arakawas that I see are green with a little bit of a tinge of red, and this one is very, very red. So I wanted to make sure that that root graft, um, uh, well, well, originally was a root graft, but now it's a little uh, small tree uh, as part of the composition, had the exact same color as the rest of the tree. What's the purpose of the mesh on the bottom? Uh, I'm trying to remember what I did there. Um, I can't remember, to be honest with you, why the mesh is there. I usually use mesh when I do a root graft. Uh, and, and actually that's one of the case studies that I wanna show you how I do root grafts. Right on top, when I'm finished with that, I put my sphagnum moss and then I cover the entire thing on the surface with mesh to kind of keep the moisture uh, level high. Uh, but in this case, I don't see, I, I, honestly, I can't remember why I had that, that roof, uh, that mesh in there. So, sorry about that. Okay, so I think one of the biggest differences here was that I, the tree was uh, repotted into, this is actually two more years uh, for in this, this tree, two more years in, in um, you know, from the last previous picture that you saw. And uh, now it's planted in a high quality coyo pot rectangular, which I think fits the, the design a little bit better, uh, at least to my eye. And you can see what was once a weird looking uh, little, you know, uh, approach graph here was, was a little twig has sort of started developing into a much more um, highly, more highly ramified uh, uh, branch. And if you remember that little piece that I, that side branch that I, you know, wire up in order to make my uh, apex, look how much more uh, developed has, it has become. So it really has now become much more of a, of a true apex, if you will. And the little tree down here is becoming much more of a, a tree rather than just a, a shoot, weird looking shoot that it was just coming out from the side of the trunk. Two thousand and fourteen to two thousand and twenty, you can see kind of the progression there. Uh, 
and in, in 2020, that I mean, that tree by no means is uh, what I would say even showable. I think I still have a few more years to go with this tree. Uh, so by no means, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, that said, uh, is ready to be shown. I think it's still a few years away from, from being showable. Uh, there are some areas that I still need further development, uh, etc. I am actually in the process of doing some uh, root grafts at the back of the of that tree, and those are still in progress. So, Joe, did you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead, please. On, on the tree that you just had before us, where you had the two side by side. Sure. Originally, there is a, um, a knot hole, a, a kind of a, where there had been a wound. And then it's barely visible on the other. Was there some sort of treatment that you did to to get that to not show so much? Can you see where I mean? I I'm sorry. I I want uh, no. Uh, okay, right here. That. I, okay, I got. Oh, I see. That was uh that that came originally with the tree. It was sort of like a hole in there, and what happened? I did not. I think if, if the question was, did I do anything to treat it? No, that was just the tree just just uh, it just grew, and it closed by itself. Um, and uh, you know, I was obviously happy. Uh, I did not think I needed that, but it came with the tree originally, and by itself, just by by you know uh, the the trunk expanding through the years and you can see slightly very slight but you can see how that, that the trunk is actually thicker here uh it just closed completely on that wound and i don't know exactly what how that wound was created it might have been uh um i don't know whether it's a branch that was cut uh or or whatnot but it, it was a fairly deep hole and it just closed uh all by itself Beautiful transformation. I do have, thank you. I do have, now that you talk about that at the end, I, one of the case studies is uh, how I close large wounds. So I will address that as well. Uh, but in this case, I had to do nothing with it. The tree just did it all by itself. And the next picture is uh, the same tree uh, last spring. And you can see how red it is. Now, if you, again, if you look at it, almost any Arakawa, they tend to be very green in the spring. They're beautiful uh, with a little tinge of red. This one is the opposite. This one is like fairly red with a little bit of green. Unfortunately, the red doesn't last too long, about I would say maybe three weeks, and then it goes all, all green. Uh, down here, if you notice, I have a few root grafts that are still in progress. And again, I will I will show you guys uh, root grafting uh, in the last section of the presentation. Next one up is a Japanese beech forest. This picture that you see in here, uh, I believe was taken back in 2003 or four. Um, and I think this might've been a Brussels bonsai. This was what, when it was originally imported from Japan. And that's what they, um, what the forest look like. And uh, back in 2014, uh, somehow that forest ended up at the Kennet Collection. I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys are, are uh, familiar or aware of Kennet Collection, which is probably, if not the best, one of the best private collections in the US is owned by Doug Paul and uh, in uh, Kennet Square in PA. And uh, he had a sale back in 2014. And uh, this is uh, the tree that I purchased actually uh, at that sale. Uh, so again, it's the same forest, but somewhere along the line um, under his care, whether it was Doc Paul himself or he may have hired some uh, professional, they decided to plant it on a, on a slab. Um, and uh, I suspect that the screen over the soil is to keep the soil uh, sort of together so that it wouldn't wash away. So that's what it looked like actually just a couple of hours after I had gotten the tree home uh, back in 2000, I think it was March, 2014. Uh, I should also mention that this was the original proposed front for the tree. And after I studied the, the tree, I looked at it from this uh, angle. I looked at it from many different angles, including, of course, the uh, the back of it. 
I decided that actually the back of the tree was going to be my new front. And this is, I think, what are you going to see in the next one? Yeah. So uh, this is, again, uh, it might have been the same day or two days after that previous picture that I'm photographing this as sort of I'm committing myself to this being my front. Mainly, I think, because this main tree here, it had better movement, in my view, than, than the other side. Uh, so I thought I was kind of excited to see this. And I said, I think this is going to be a, a better front for, uh, for, for this uh, tree. I also thought that it was very, um, it was very highly, you know, it was mounted too high for my, for, to my eye. So I think in the future, one of the plans that I had, to, that I wanted to do is when, you know, when uh, this tree uh, was repotted, I wanted to lower the, the, you know, the sort of the profile of that soil so that the whole thing sat a little bit lower within the slab. And the slab, by the way, is made out of granite. So it's a natural slab uh, and it's quite nice. The other thing that I noticed too in this uh, forest was the, it was fairly well ramified, but I wanted to um, improve the structure for sure. And, if you will, the uh, a, a little bit the logic uh, of, of of how the, the the branches were kind of growing because the, the reason why I mentioned that is because there were a lot of branches that were kind of almost even growing towards the trunk itself. That that of course does not make much sense because all branches sort of growing outwards, looking for light in a natural environment. Uh, so for me, it was the, the the branch structure looked kind of messy. And I wanted to uh, reset a lot of those uh, those branches so that it had a better feel. The other thing to my eye that I was picking up, and let me grab my pen so I can just uh, uh, show you guys. It is um, let's see, okay. For me, my eye was doing this it was an uh, sort of a lopsided triangle, okay, and. Um, that that was a little bit uh, felt a little bit weird to me. Uh, I wanted the whole thing to have a little more of a more of a stable uh, sort of feel to it. So uh, I, you know, again, I wanted to kind of redesign the tree or readjust it, if you will, so that it became. And uh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, yeah, okay. I wanted to, and you'll see in in a second more of a stable triangular uh, outline to my canopy. All right, moving on. And I think the next picture is going to be about two years after. And you can see how I'm aiming to kind of bring the right hand side a little bit down so that it's time to become a little more of a stable triangular uh, silhouette uh, on my, um, uh, you know, on the composition. And, um, also, you may notice too how the branching has a little more of an organized feel to them rather than this sort of haphazard sort of, you know, uh, branch, branch, branches crossing each other, growing towards the trunks, and et cetera, et cetera. And also, I think also in some areas, uh, it was uh, a little bit too congested, so I needed to edit down the, um, uh, the, uh, the canopy a little bit, uh, to, to make a little more, you know, to open up, op open up the, um, the, the tree. Uh, this picture was taken in late August, a few days before it was exhibited at the U S national in 2016. And this is what it looks like in leaf. Uh, this is a picture that was taken by Joe Noga, who actually photographs all of the nationals, um, you know, for Bill Lovanis, and uh, this, that's his photograph. But this photograph was actually taken uh, by him at the Winter Silhouette in Canapolis. Every year they have a Winter Silhouette show, which is great. It's a very beautiful show. And this is what the tree looked like in, uh, at the show. Uh, a couple of things quickly that I want to mention in Japan, uh, Japanese beach, oftentimes they get, uh, they, they get shown with, um, uh, with their dead leaves 
on them. And the second thing is you will notice that I did a very untraditional sort of display here with uh, instead of a wooden classical more you know wooden uh, table, I use a plexiglass table. And I wanted to uh, give the feel of like almost like a floating forest of, of sorts, uh, but hopefully in a in a more understated, elegant way. Sergio, how yes. do you have your moss so green? Oh, uh, I I think well, uh, you know, I think I took uh, some moss that I had around and I just put it on the tree for the show. Uh, but some of the, my moss it stays pretty green, believe it or not, during the winter time. They don't, it doesn't go brown or anything like that. And did you, did you transplant it just once during this time to bring it down lower? No, uh, it, it does look a little lower, doesn't it? But it's no, you'll, you'll see in the next picture how it looks a little bit lower. But yeah, it's almost like, I feel like it somehow, um, I don't know if it was soil erosion, but it does look a little bit lower than when it was originally because originally it was like really, really kind of high. Uh, and this feels, feels better to the eye, I think. Uh, you'll see in the next picture, in the more final picture where it's a little bit low, lower still, but no, to answer your question, I had not uh, repotted this tree yet, but between this picture and the next, which is this one, this is more, uh, this was taken, I think last, um, I think last spring or, or two springs ago. And uh, you can see that the soil is definitely a lot lower. The, the profile of, the, of that soil is lower. I think to my eyes, a little more proportional, right? Again, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of things about bonsai is about getting those proportions, you know, dialed in just quite right. And uh, you can see, as opposed to the original picture, how the general silhouette is, feels a little more stable, feels more like a stable triangular uh, uh, silhouette, rather than this sort of lopsided one, uh, where, how it came originally. Can you speak about how you uh, made that soil mask uh, smaller? Sure, it was just a matter of like, uh, when I was repotting it, um, I cut uh, more of the roots and it was just a matter of just reducing the root ball. Um, and, um, and I'm sure you guys, maybe some of you may be familiar. I had to, you know, whenever you do a, a, this type of uh, planting on a slab, you do kind of this wall of, uh, you know, kind of muck, right? Muck soil, which is kind of like this, um, you know, just, just almost like, a, you know, it's almost like a putty almost uh, consistency. And uh, you do this wall around it and then I filled it with a uh, mixture of Akadama and Kiryu uh, soil. That's, that's sort of the soil that I use. And, uh, but it was a matter of, I think, just, just again, reducing the, um, uh, the root ball just that much more. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, beach, uh, Japanese beach in particular, not European beach, but uh, Japanese beach can be a little tricky uh, in, in the sense of uh, it can give uh, you difficulties in, in um, uh, ramifying. Uh, and I've experienced, uh, or at least in my experience, we, you know, lower branches that are a little bit weaker than the strong branches up in the top if you cut back to no viable uh, buds, um, usually that, at least in my experience, uh, that branch has died back. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful. It's very different than Japanese maples where you kind of chop a branch maybe in half, let's just say, to no, no visible buds and it'll just pop buds everywhere. Beach is not like that at all. Um, unless you're dealing with a very young tree, but this is a, a fairly old, Forest, I'm gonna venture it's probably around 40, 50 years old. And uh, you gotta have to be careful. They're also apically very dominant. Um, so you have to be very, very cognizant that, uh, you know, or, or just on top, managing that strength on the tips in order to preserve the strength of the uh, lower uh, branches. Uh, otherwise it'll just take over and a lot of the lower branches will start dying off. Okay, any questions before I jump to the next one? Well, wait a minute. So are, are those 
roots fused? They're fused now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. By now, okay. um, they're fused. They used to be, if you remember back in the first picture that I showed you on a pod, at that time, uh, they were all single trees, or at least I'm imagining they were single trees. Right. Uh, but now it's so old that the whole thing is almost, a, it, it, it becomes, it has become a clump style more than, a, than anything else. They all fuse all the trees completely. Very nice. Completely. So they're, they're interesting enough. They're sharing uh, the whole, the system, the whole system is being shared by all of them. Um, so it's interesting how you have to be careful because they're not individual trees. So what happens is one tree can start sucking all the energy while, while the rest may start weakening. It's almost like the same way uh, as when a tree, you have a tree, a single trunk tree, and the lower branches start weakening. It's a little bit like that, the same sort of idea, but with different trees. So that's what happens with the... Um, uh, or at least what I'm experiencing with the with this clump is that I have to be careful how I manage the strength of some of the stronger trees in order to redistribute that 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 strength to the other trees to to make sure that they all stay very healthy and and uh, you know and, and growing. Um, so yeah, that's what I was noticing. The one just to the left of the main one is starting to look kind of. Weak. Yeah, puny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 So, and and of course, as you might have guessed, they start shading each other, etc. So it becomes, it becomes a real challenge to kind of keep something like this nice and healthy and everything growing well and evenly. It is, it is a challenge for sure, um, because then you start dealing with that. I do leaf cut. I'm sure you, many of you are maybe familiar. I do leaf cut this uh this forest quite a bit every single year in order to allow light and air inside of the canopy uh so that's something that i have to do religiously every single year i do not defoliate this tree at all i do defoliate all the trees like japanese maples i do but the japanese uh beach can be finicky uh and they can be somewhat delicate so i i do not do that kind of um technique uh or procedure on this on this tree are you able to get a second flush out of this? Yeah, but it's weak. Um, you, I, I do uh, here and there. I do get uh, shoots, and I pinch them right away. Uh, so yes, but as far as like a, 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 you know, if we're gonna say like a strong second flush, no. It's 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 typically a weak flush uh, that you get, uh, especially when you start do, doing leaf cut and stuff like that. The tree reacts in response to that and puts out more shoots, but it's, I wouldn't say it's like a strong uh, second flush. Okay, next one is Akashima Japanese maple. And this is what it looked like, uh, I think a couple of years after I bought it from Suthin. I'm sure you guys are familiar with him, uh, exceptional uh, bonsai artist uh, up in uh, Massachusetts. And I purchased this Kashima from him many years ago. Uh, this is what it looked like. And uh, you might be surprised about the next picture I'm gonna show you, which looked like this. And you may ask, well, <laughs> what happened to the tree? Uh, so uh, Kashima has uh, the tendency uh, to wake up uh, kind of early. Uh, you know, even if you keep it pretty cold, uh, you know, some years, early February, the, the, the budget's going to start pushing. And that becomes a problem, right? Because, you know, everything outside is like, you know, in the teens or 20s, and you certainly do not, cannot have the tree outside while it's pushing. So I had the brilliant idea, and you will see that that was probably very, very stupid, that uh, as I was pushing, I said, well, let me, let me put it outside. This was many years ago. I put it outside to kind of stall, right? The, 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 the whole process of the tree flushing out, et cetera. So I said, let me, let me just put it outside. Maybe the cold will kind of hold it back a little bit. And the, I, I think that the tree had been exposed to about two or three nights straight to low twenties during the night. Uh, about two or three weeks later, I saw that a lot of the buds have turned like a deep uh, crimson color. And uh, even worse, a lot of the uh, branching uh, got that sort of dreaded wrinkled 
uh, look to them, which we all know that that's trouble. Uh, and sure enough, pretty much as you can see here, uh, I would say half or more than half the tree died back. And this is where I was left. This is all it had alive. Uh, and the reason why I show you this is because sometimes uh, disasters can show you a better, uh, better results in the end. You end up with better results. Um, I, I, I think you might agree when you see the finished tree, well, not the finished tree, but the more, more developed tree that I, that I uh, created from this that you're seeing, uh, created a much more a smaller and more compact tree than it was originally uh, looked at. Uh, again, it had a very long sort of apex. The tree almost looked like it was going on up uh, forever, that, that apex. And I uh, forced me to create a much smaller tree out of uh, this whole mess. And uh, this was, I uh, believe, um, that same year, I cut it all back and uh, I repotted it. I cut a lot of the dead uh, roots off and repotted it in fresh soil. And the tree took a long time to get healthy again. This I believe is the following year or two years after. And now I'm beginning to see how the tree is gaining a lot of strength. At this point, I'm not worried about the length of the internodes. Uh, some of them are pretty long, um, but all I wanted to do is not really uh, so much design the tree, think about uh, what is the design of the tree, but more about the health of the tree. I needed this tree to get healthy and strong so that then I can uh, begin the whole uh, design uh, bonsai process once again. You can see though, I was pretty confident that wiring a couple of branches, I was confident that it was okay. So I started wiring a few things here and there, but not much else I did with this tree. This is uh, about, uh, I think I, the, the following year, uh, that I took this picture, and you can see how I'm, uh, you know, I'm getting a good extension on those branches now, and now I'm pretty confident. Uh, I'm trying to kind of now decide, okay, where is this tree growing, going design-wise, and I'm wiring my branches to start uh, sort of setting my structure for the future canopy, and this was what was a side branch. Again, I am building into my future apex. If you can remember, this was here, um, see, oops, the apex kept going this way. Don't be afraid to take that apex to the left real hardcore. Yes. <laughs> hey, with the wiring on this, do you wire right at leaf drop in the fall or do you wire in the spring before bud yeah, brush? That's a, that's a great question and one that it has, it's a little bit controversial. Uh, even here in the Northeast, I, I just did uh, sometimes when I, you know, when I do my workshops, uh, workshops and lectures and stuff like that, invariably there's uh, a few guys that actually wire now in the fall. I, I like to wire late winter, early spring uh, for whatever reason. And I have my theories about it. Um, it has given me uh, sort of uh, not, not, it, it's, it's been not a good thing to basically wire uh, my trees in the fall. Uh, and I'm, when I mean wire, I, I don't mean just a few branches. I think a few branches is okay. Uh, I mean, like really do a wiring job. I don't usually get into that until late winter, early spring, and I avoid fall. Now, there's folks that say even here in my area where they say, well, I wire now and I have no problems. And all I have to say is like, great, just keep doing what you're doing. If it's working for you, great. Um, but for me, it hasn't, it hasn't worked out that way, unfortunately. So I have to, usually I have to wait until uh, late winter in order to, to uh, really do uh, any kind of wiring work. Now, as far as pruning, uh, that's a little bit of a different story. I do prune now. Um, I do think it's, it's better to prune now than late winter. The reason for that, uh, at least in my view, is you allow the tree, um, you know, a period where it can, um, you know, reallocate those resources when you when you prune, reallocate those resources to weaker areas, and you give the the the, uh, the tree 
the entire uh, dormant season basically to reallocate that, that energy uh, as opposed to the trees flushing out or, or even right before it and you chop it. I mean, again, you won't eat the tree one is not going to die. You're probably not going to kill any branches then. I just think it's a little bit better to prune now than, than late winter. Um, but and, that's, and are, yeah. Are you able to get a second flush out of this maple? Uh, I'm trying to remember because I saw this tree some years ago. Um, if, if left alone, no. However, I did push it hard and you'll see the reason why, and you, you'll see the, the before and after and within four or five years, I had almost like a, a canopy that was fairly developed. You'll see in a moment. And people have asked me how, how was I able to do that so quickly? And that was through defoliation. I defoliated the, you know, completely this tree a couple of times within those five years. Um, I don't do it every year. I do it maybe every other year. I defoliate it, pushed out, and I, I increase the ramification in that tree. And that's how I was able to kind of expedite, if you will, the, the process uh, for building this tree. But to answer your question, I think if I'm remembering, I think it's uh, what typically you would call a, a single flush uh, maple, I believe, is that if I left it alone, didn't do much with it, I don't think it was like, um, it, it wasn't, putting like multiple flushes as like many times, just straight Acer palmatum will do. Um, the Kashima is, is supposed to be one of the Yatsubusa, kind of like, a, you know, a dwarf maple. And uh, it doesn't put much of a, of, a second, of a strong second flush. What month would you defoliate in, in the years that you did defoliate? Sure, uh, usually uh, I do it uh, late June, right after hardening, late June. Uh, mid to late June, I would say, I defoliate the tree and uh, within, uh, say, three to four weeks, I would say, uh, it's got a new set of leaves. Maybe a month after, uh, uh, you know, I have another crop of, of leaves uh, out. Usually I defoliate um, not, I mean, I hear people, use, well, you get, uh, you get better autumn color, you get smaller leaves, and yeah, to a degree that may be true. I usually defoliate to kind of expedite my my uh, you know the, the building process of my of my canopy. That's mainly why I do it. It does push a lot of new growth. Um, as, as some people say, you you kind of uh, induce a second spring on on the tree. Um, this is another year, and you can see that now that uh, I'm getting quite a bit of extension on on that canopy. So it's not looking like a stump anymore. It's looking a little more like a tree. And you may wonder why I'm leaving that apex. The apex needed to strengthen and I'm growing one long whip in order to bring it around and uh, do either a thread graft. I believe I ended up doing actually an approach graft on this area right here. This may look like I have a branch here. It's a little deceiving in the photograph, but that branch actually comes from the back, but I needed a branch to locate a branch right in there. And if you remember, that was where the original apex was coming out from. This is a tree a year after that. So you can see how much more development has gotten. Um, I sold this tree right after, I, a couple of days after I actually took this picture. This was back in, oh gosh, I re don't remember, 2017, I think. Uh, this tree by no means was finished. I needed to kind of fill in a little more, round off that canopy. And uh, this is a spring shot that I took from that same year. And they have, they have these wonderfully red, orange leaves, the, the Kashima maples. And I think I have, yes, okay. So what is that? Five years uh, between 2012 and, and 2017. And you can see how fairly quickly uh, in terms of bonds as, as you know, uh, in, in bonsai terms, I would say five years is pretty, pretty quick. Any questions on this before I jump into the next tree? 
what, what an inspiration. You, you took a disaster and you turned it into to something beautiful. I think that's an awesome progression in five years. That's, that's very little time for deciduous. Yeah, th thank you. I think the, the takeaway from this, this one here was like, don't, don't despair. Uh, because believe me, I'm no exception. I, I saw what happened and I wanted to throw out the tree. I was so disheartened by it that uh, the only thing that kept me was that that lower trunk was so beautiful and the Nevada was so strong that I said, well, it's probably worth for me to try to, to do something with this tree. And I'm glad that I didn't, but I, I, at the time I really wanted to just kind of throw it out because I was just so, so uh, disheartened by, by what had happened. Of course, I learned a very hard lesson uh, and, you know, but I, I wanted to kind of share with you guys because, um, you know, uh, I think it's important to share our successes as well as our failures. Uh, but, but the fact that I wanted to kind of stall the, the you know, uh, the, the push in that, that spring with just making, you know, uh, exposing this tree to very low temperatures was the worst, absolutely the worst idea anybody could come up with. Uh, but, you know, anyway, so that was a lesson learned. I'm glad the tree uh, recovered. And uh, like I said, I, I, I saw this tree uh, shortly after I had taken these pictures in 2017. All right, the next case is a, believe it or not, it's a, another Japanese maple, may not look like it, but uh, that's what it is. And actually this came from originally from Randy Knight. Uh, and I'm sure you guys know that Randy Knight is very well known for collecting awesome conifer material. And he works of course very closely with Ryan Neal. And, uh, but he does grow the citrus. And uh, I don't know whether he grew this or whether he, this was something he collected. Um, and I, I understand that this tree also went through a workshop with Walter Powell, etc. So it has a little bit of a long history. And this was the original front as it was given to me uh, or when I purchased it. Purchased it. This is the, the original front. I'm going to show you the back because the back became my new front. And the reason for that, I think the reason why they wanted this to be the front is because the back, I'll show you now, had a huge... Um, chunk of uh, dead wood and a huge car here. So by using this as a front, you kind of hide all that stuff. Uh, however, uh, I do think in this case, as they say, if you cannot beat them, join them. Uh, so I said, well, what about if this became my new front and I am going to make those feature, those, you know, that dead wood, my main feature for the design. And that's what I set out to do. Um, so this was the tree after it was repotted. And let me explain. Here is the, of course, the, the original Nebari. And um, I was lucky enough that when I repotted it, I found a better and a stronger Nebari below it. Now, the original Nebari was all the way up here. And what I liked about it is that it gave the tree a little more height, a little more, well, this is not an elegant tree, but uh, a little more elegance. Uh, let, me, let me use that word. Um, you know, even though it's, I know it's not an elegant tree, but it gave it a little height. The other one was a little too stumpy. So I was lucky enough to find a better nebari underneath that soil. Um, and this is uh, right after repotting. And uh, this is after carving the, the dead wood. So you notice, going back to, the, I made this, um, well, I carved this entire thing on the left but I also made the scar, this uh, on the right, a lot larger. And I joined it to the top so that it became more of a feature than, than, a, than an actual detriment, if you will. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the canopy was roughly uh, wire at the same time, just to give uh, kind of a sense of where this tree was going. It was, so it was going to be kind of this, so, sort of informal uh, broom style of sorts. Detail of the carving work. Another detail. And after I carved it, I painted it uh, with ink just to set that, that fresh wood, uh, you know, uh, kind of tone it down, if you will, because as you know, when you carve the wood, it's just very bright and fresh and, and you know, it just kind of like, 
it screams for attention. And I wanted to make sure that it feels, it felt like old and, and, uh, and, you know, and a little more quiet so that it didn't, it didn't, uh, uh, you know, command so much attention. Did you use Sumi ink? What did you use the dye? Yeah, yeah, it was like a Sumi ink. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, I think, I believe that's exactly what I used. Like di diluted 50, 50 or what? Uh, you do it? I think it was a little bit diluted. If I remember correctly, I don't remember how much water I put in it, but I put a little bit just to kind of just, you know, set it down a little bit. Um, you know, uh, yeah. That's a great technique. I haven't seen that before. That's inspiring. Here's a detail of the uh, the canopy. All right, and as, as some of you may know, uh, a lot of the process with the seedless trees is letting them grow, cutting them back, letting them grow again, cutting them back, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. So this this was no exception. I needed to uh, elongate, let it grow because I wanted to improve the uh, branch uh, branch transitions from trunk to primary to secondary. So this was part of the process. And here was my tree before I sold it. Um, and uh, I'll show you a very quick uh, before and after. Uh, to only two years, only two years for this one. So this was even quicker. Again, it was defoliated, uh, I think at least, at least once within those two years. And it gave me uh, it gave me an extra sort of uh, set of branching to play with, and you can see again the sort of transformation between uh, what it was in 2014 to 2016. Uh, the, at the time when I took the picture, that pot uh, was just for training purposes. It was definitely not a, a you know a um, a for you know a finished pot, and certainly once again this was not what I would call a showable tree. It needed a lot of refinement, uh, even though it may look kind of almost finished. Um, had I kept the tree, it, it, needed, it needed quite a bit of uh, still refinement in that canopy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I was, again, I was pretty, pretty pleased with, the, with how, I mean, how quickly it just kind of transformed itself within two years. Any I'm questions? curious, how do you get such ramification in two years? Uh, what 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 do you use for fertilizer? Uh, well, I, I use a combination of uh, of just bio gold and, uh, and fish emulsion. That's mainly my two, you know, uh, sort of uh, primary, uh, you know, fertilizers. And uh, for the most part, and then I use a product. Once in a while, I'll put uh, sea kelp on it, and uh, I use a product um, also made by Dana Grow. I think I think it goes by few names. I think one of them is it's called Bonsai Pro or something like that. It's a fairly well balanced um, fertilizer, and I and I use that once in a while on the trees. I don't use a whole lot. I do use. I, I do use, I, at the beginning, I do use quite a bit of uh, BioGold. Now, let me make a distinction too. Um, for development trees versus trees that are in refinement, trees that are in refinement, I do use, I do pull back quite a bit on, on the amount of fertilizer because I don't want, I don't want to, to you know, uh, sort of promote very, very coarse, very strong growth on my ramification. In the seed use trees, you want to get that fine ramification, especially at the tips. Um, but in trees like this, uh, I, I, I remember just fertilizing the crap out of, the, of this one just to, to get a lot, as much growth as, as possible. I, again, had I kept the tree, I would have started pulling back on it as, I'm, I'm, as I was starting to refine that canopy. Uh, because if I'm looking now, I'm, I'm looking at some, you know, uh, some notes, uh, internodes that are a little bit too long, I would have shortened those. Uh, so that, that it became a, then a process of, of, uh, of further refinement. When do you start fertilizing? Uh, as soon as the, the trees kind of uh, start pushing, around that time, I start, I start fertilizing. Maybe I wait a little bit after the leaves come out, and then I fertilize. Uh, and I, I again, I put uh, the the bio gold cakes on it, and then every two weeks, every two weeks more or less, I put the fish fertilizer. And the fish fertilizer for me is the one that, um, or at least the one that I use, is the one that you find in at Home Depot or Lowe's. is uh, It's made by Alaska, I think. 
Mm-hmm. And that's the one that I use. There may be, there may, I'm sure that there's other ones that, that folks use, but that's, that's the one that I use. Have yeah. you experimented with rapeseed cakes? I have not, but I have heard uh, great things about it. But, but honestly, I, I would say right now I have not, no. What did you use to do the carving? Oh, uh, a Dremel. A Dremel and, um, and then I, after I was done, because the wood was so like punky in a way, I put uh, a wood hardener on it and uh, just to just to to stabilize stabilize i think a little bit the you know the wood a little more uh because it was really kind of soft it was starting to like really crumble it was an old tree that was that was really kind of neglected for for a while sorry somebody was asking a question yeah how many times do you prune did you prune this maple after it hardened off in the spring um I do know that uh, hard enough, I would prune it once. It may, may have been two or three times, depending on how many flushes. I, I do remember this tree. This, was, this is a straight ace of palmatum. So it put multiple flushes uh, throughout the season. And as needed, uh, whether maybe I kept that shoot because I needed to thicken that particular area, or if I, I did not, I cut it back. And when I cut it back, it may just produce another set of, uh, you know, uh, of shoots, basically. Uh, so I think it put a few. Um, but when I say a few, it's not like, you know, I, I, I can say like a strong flush or anything like that. They were weaker uh, flushes, but it would put a few. So you would wait till they hardened off before you pruned them on each flush, correct? Yes, correct, correct. Okay, thank correct. you. Sure, of course. And uh, like I said, in, uh, one, once in that period of time between 2014 and 16, I uh, defoliated the tree completely, completely. Now with defoliation, and I'm sure you guys have heard about it, uh, it, it you have to be careful, right? And, and it's interesting because I think some professionals shy away from full defoliation and some professionals do believe in it. I am I'm one that, that um, uh, I've gotten very good results from defoliating a tree, but you have to be careful because if you, um, if you defoliate a tree that is uh, even slightly bit weaker uh, or weak, uh, you can you can uh, severely set that tree back or even kill it. So you got to be really careful. You got to know your tree. You got to make sure that that tree is really really healthy before you you do something because it really debilitates the tree. Uh, that's a procedure that is very debilitating to the tree. But if the tree is healthy, without a doubt, within like three four weeks, it just pushes out again. Okay, uh, this is a, a Kiyohime Japanese maple. And again, I'm, I'm showing you a series of uh, failures and how I've, uh, hopefully I have turned these failures into a little more successful stories. <laughs> uh, but this is another, another one of those. Um, it was one of the, my best shocking at the time. And this is what was left of it. What happened to this tree? Uh, this is another experiment that I did that was a complete failure. I, um, again, Kiyohime, just like the Kashima that we saw uh, a few moments ago, uh, tend to push uh, out early, very early. Like, uh, again, it could be early February or mid-February, and it pushes out. And it's kind of annoying because you're, I mean, it, it's like, you know, it, I, and I keep my space pretty cold. I would say... Uh, average temperature is about 35 degrees, uh, which I, I, you know, I think is ideal for for um, keeping your deciduous trees over the winter. Uh, but even so, it, it is just dying to wake up in you know in, in very late uh, or late winter. Anyway, so it did. So in order to kind of stall it, I put it in the refrigerator because I said, well, the the te- temperature is stable. Let me see if I can just stall it a little bit, right? Uh, and what happened was the refrigerator just sucked all the moisture out of the tree. So much like the Kashima, all the branches died except this one branch that was left alive. And uh, what to do with this tree, right? So I either throw it out, <laughs> give it to your neighbor, 
or maybe make it into a cascade, which I decided that that's what was, I was going to do. When everything else fails, just make it into a cascade and you'll be okay. So here is my attempt to make it into a cascade. Of course, the pot is way big because I want to, uh, at this point, again, even though I'm thinking, okay, it could be sort of a cascade in the future, I wanna make sure that the tree regains its health. And that's why it's uh, uh, potted in something uh, larger than, than it should have. And this is actually a few years after. Uh, this is what the tree was looking like, much smaller pot now, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I became a little bit disheartened with the tree. I thought it was okay tree, but I wanted to do something hopefully a little more interesting with it. And as you can see, it was, it was headed towards uh, being made into a, a cascade at this point. This picture, this project was uh, done this past uh, spring. So this is what the tree looked like. Um, I think this was uh, March. And I decided uh, last year, I saw a beautiful stone uh, uh, from Japan and I purchased it, purchased, purchased the, the stone and I made this uh, out of that. Um, so for me it was a, a moment where uh, all the elements kind of came together uh, hopefully into something a little more interesting than, than what I had before. Uh, it was definitely a little more exciting for me to, um, you know, to, to kind of combine these elements. Certainly, I think the stone was very unique. I like the fact that it has a lot of visual tension where the top is almost, is almost, almost top heavy with that very thin neck. It, it almost feels like, is this thing gonna fall over? It's not that kind of tension sort of for me was a little bit, was definitely exciting. Um, and that's an American pot uh, that I use uh, for the, to sort of finish, finish the composition. And I kind of balance, balance the whole thing with, um, uh, with some dwarf acelias uh, all the way on the bottom right. And uh, that's what was created. Uh, this is a before and after. And again, the, the actual tree itself needs a lot of development, needs a lot of uh, refinement. So by no means is something that, uh, that I would say, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, done with this. I think it needs development, but I'm fairly happy with, uh, with how this thing kind of turned out. And uh, this is actually a picture that I took uh, last, uh, I think this was August, this past August. And to show you a little bit of behind the scenes of how this was created, uh, I created some walls. This is the back of the stone. This is where the tree is gonna be located, the roots. And I created a, a wall of muck. And I have my wire set in order to kind of, uh, again, uh, hold the tree in place. The stone itself had a round concrete base, uh, which uh, was, tied down to the pot or secured to the, to, the, uh, to the pot with wire. Another shot, this is a tree in place. So I created kind of like, again, like almost like a pot uh, where inside I was going to put uh, all my soil and you can see it here. Okay, so yeah, that was the end of that that one. Any, any, any questions on, on this particular one, guys? How is that not top heavy? I mean, is the top not as heavy as it looks? No, I mean, it's a stone, right? So it, it, everything is, is just one piece. And uh, yeah, it just, it, it's just one piece. <laughs> it just doesn't, you know, I mean, it's all very rigid. It's all very rigid all the way to the bottom. Yeah. The trick here was not so much as it was really fastening the or securing the stone itself, the whole entire piece to the pot itself. Uh, but it, it's very stable. You just put it down and uh, that thing just stays. I mean, it's pretty grounded. Okay, uh, Japanese white beach. And uh, once again, another hopeless project. Uh, 
in this case, I this was air layer from a much larger tree. And what happened was the main trunk, for whatever reason, just collapsed. Um, I do believe that uh, Japanese speech uh, can be a little bit tricky to air layer. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to get uh, roots all around your trunk. Some Many times you end up with uh, some roots here and there, but not all around the trunk. And I, I think that um, perhaps the root system was uh, not robust enough to sustain uh, the main trunk, which is fairly thick. This was maybe about three inches. Uh, just to give you a sense of uh, size, this is about three inches diameter, the, the main trunk here, but it died back. Um, interesting enough, it grew, the whole entire piece grew very well through the growing season after it was separated. Uh, the area was separated, it grew very strong, and then all of a sudden when fall came, the main trunk collapsed completely. So that was a very sort of unique case that I, I, um, I had not seen, I did not know exactly why that happened, but I was left with this, uh, uh, you know, with the rest of the branches doing okay, uh, completely fine. Uh, so I decided to do another, um, uh, I, I wanted to combine this with another stone. So I started, um, I, I needed to cut a, a section of it. A lot of it was actually dead. So I wanted to, I needed to cut uh, the base of that, uh, you know, a big chunk of it away in order to, for, for this material to be even usable. Uh, I started with a saw, but then, you know, I decided to use a miter saw <laughs> because it was just a little faster. And here I am with a miter saw and just cutting right through the, uh, the, the main root ball. Here is the uh, material uh, with a big chunk uh, cut off. And here is securing to the stone. And the next shot is what I created out of that material. Some detailed pictures of uh, um, the composition. I use uh, you know, some ferns and stuff like that to, to complete the, the image. What's the substrate the substrate in the pot, the, the white stuff? The white, oh, the white stuff here, this is a sui ban, that's all for presentation. So that's just, uh, that's just a white, white sand. Like I think uh, it's coral based sand that I use for this shot. Yeah, so again, the, the tree is not growing into that sand. That's just for presentation purposes. It's really the whole thing just is growing inside of the pot. I literally had to thread it was one of those cases where I literally had to thread uh, the roots of this tree through a lot of the cavities in that hole. And it was a fairly aggressive uh, procedure that it was one of those things that I said, you know what, it's either gonna live or it's gonna die. And I did it um, and uh, it survived. It did, it did great. Uh, it grew very, very well uh, this past year. And, uh, you know, so. Uh, so I'm hope, hopeful that that will continue uh, moving forward. And just for fun, I threw in a conifer here for you guys. This is uh, uh, Thuja occidentalis, uh, otherwise known as uh, Eastern White Cedar or Arbovite. And uh, used uh, extensively here for landscape. This, was, this tree was collected uh, in Vermont by, uh, I don't know the collector, uh, and then was purchased by Suthin. And this is a little bit rare because most thujas have large fronds. This one is a small leaf, naturally a, a sort of a dwarf leaf. Uh, thuja again is a wild collected uh, piece. And uh, this particular piece, I'm only gonna take part, uh, part credit on because uh, Suthin did an amazing job in really transforming, you'll see in a moment what he did with it. So this is the material, raw material, as, as Suthin got it, and he did this with that. And this picture was taken uh, back in 2008, was exhibited at the US National, uh, the first US National. And this is what the tree looked like at the time. And then back in, 
2015 or 16, I purchased a tree from Suthain. And this was taking the day that I, I got it back in my garden. So I took a quick picture. And the tree uh, had, it has a very sort of intricate uh, network of, uh, of jeans and sherries, which uh, was really appealing to me. And one of the reasons why I purchased, purchased the tree. Uh, but I, I, um, I let it grow uh, that year that I had it. And this is what it, um, what it looked like right before uh, or shortly before I start, uh, restyled it. I let it grow. And uh, this is what the tree looked like after I styled it. The white stuff, by the way, is uh, snow. It was sitting outside in the snow. I thought it was the, you know, it was kind of cool. So I brought it inside and I took a quick picture of it. So I didn't want you to think, you guys think that uh, <laughs> the white stuff was some, some kind of fungus or something, uh, but it was actually snow. And uh, this is uh, uh, a year later, uh, this was taken uh, about a couple of days before it was exhibited at the US National in 2018. And uh, it's shown with a new pot here. And Thuja, in this case, um, the difference between when I got the tree, let me go back if I may. If you notice the way it was, uh, this tree was actually um, style is that, and a lot of folks, uh, you know, do this with uh, Thuja. It's a little bit like the, the, the fronts kind of grow up and they pluck it. And uh, it's a little bit like how they treat junipers in a way. Um, and uh, it's just a particular aesthetic. But for me, uh, a lot of, sometimes the fronts on Thuja has a tendency to curve down and that, that was inspiration enough for me to kind of go the other way. And this is why I started styling the whole thing with this sort of curve, curving the paths going downwards. The other thing I wanted to point out, point out is that originally the tree was like trunk and foliage, trunk on the left and foliage on the right. And what I needed to do was sort of have a little bit of a uh, sort of a synthesis, a little more of a um, union or, or better uh, sort of um, dialogue, if you will, between the trunk and the foliage. So I needed to kind of regrow, uh, let some of that foliage grow so that I was able to put some of that in front of the, the trunk line to soften that, that you know, the, the line itself. And on the left-hand side, it needed to be extended so that it would balance the composition a little bit better. So you can see it here, how I uh, extended the left and some of the foliage starts kind of going in front of that trunk line just to soften it up a little bit. A, a question? Of course. Uh, yes, did you have to wire all of those little fronds to get oh, them yeah. down? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I, well, I don't know about all of them, but most of them, yes, yes, yeah. Wow, oh my goodness. A lot of work. A, a lot, lot of work. work. Yes, a lot of work, I kid you not. In fact, I'm, I'm getting ready to, to do another styling on that tree in, uh, in another week or so. But um, yeah, it, was, it is definitely a lot, a lot of work. Uh, this is the same tree as uh, was exhibited as it looked uh, exhibited at the U, um, uh, Winter Silhouette in Kannapolis. And this is just uh, an effect of the picture, but uh, you know, it looks like I, I, I just put uh, tons of lime sulfur on the wood, but that's just the, the flash. Uh, I did not use that much, you know, the, the wood is not that white in reality. Okay. Uh, so you can see 10 years, 2008 and 2018, uh, the tree feels uh, just a little, I, I guess a little more mature in, in, its, um, in its silhouette. I wanted to, again, the, the top of it is uh, much more rounded uh, and the tank gene still there, I, I think it's a little bit, uh, became a little bit invisible against that light background, but it's still there. 
uh, even though it was shortened at some point, not by me. I think Suthin might have shortened that at some point. Um, but uh, but anyway, so that's uh, and if you notice the table that I uh, I made, um, I ordered a custom a custom made table for the tree where the legs are curved to just mimic the downward uh, sort of motion of of the foliage pads. Okay, any questions on that? Your vision is amazing. Your creative skills, very impressive. Thank you. I think okay. the lesson that I've learned is that uh, maybe I give up too easily on things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, not, not every case that I have on my trees are, are being like uh, disasters made into something, uh, hopefully a little more interesting. I, I do have a lot of trees that are like, you know, I, I got them and I worked on them and they're all fine, but I wanted to show you guys a few of the more, I guess you're gonna call it a little more dramatic transformations just because uh, I, th I think that that's a, maybe the moral of the story, Renee, is that, you know, uh, don't give up easily on the stuff. And just with a little bit of imagination, you can turn something that is kind of okay into something a little more interesting, for sure. Yeah. I'll take a, di a different look at things now before they go into the yard waste. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. How long have you been at this? Because this has been an amazing evening. What you've shown us, your gardens. I mean, this is something. How long have you been oh, doing? Well, oh, thank you. Uh, well, it's a little bit of um, uh, it's a little complicated story to tell. But let me just say, I've I've done this for close to thirty years. However, out of the thirty years, I would say maybe ten of twelve, ten or twelve of those have been like really studying this um in depth uh mm -hmm. before that it was for me it was just more of a kind of a hobby a light hobby i was just growing plants on pots i was yeah you know they, they were always very interesting to me but in the last 10 to 12 years i really kind of have uh, uh applied myself much more seriously you would say than than i was before that time but mm -hmm. but all in all more or less 30 years something okay. like that yeah and are you an artist? I am. Is, yeah, I okay. am. That's my background. You're absolutely stunning evening. The, the trees, the settings. I mean, this has been a highlight of oh, thank you. I'm thank really you. enjoying your, your show, your presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you. I, pre I really do appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, so I have uh, uh, four case studies, I believe, and they all deal with different techniques. Um, you know, so the first one is, um, is an approach graft, and you'll see how I'm using this approach graft. Uh, approach grafts are very useful. All kinds of grafts are extremely useful to elevate uh, the, the quality of your deciduous material. I'm not gonna talk about conifers because that's a little bit of a different story. And, and oftentimes, as far as that's concerned, it's a much slower process and more difficult. Uh, but with the CGS, again, whether it's root grafting, approach grafting, thread grafting, uh, I'm gonna show you an interesting one which, where a lot of, uh, some people call it peg grafting. It's a little tricky and I, I'm, I'm excited to show you guys that. Uh, but all these techniques are applied um, at the right times and when appropriate in order to kind of elevate the quality of, of your material. Anyway, so this is a Japanese maple that, um, this is a photograph that the grower is, a, it was a grower, I don't, know, I don't think she, she's in bonsai anymore, uh, in upstate New York that was selling her trees. And this is the, the tree that I bought back in 2009. And uh, so she sent me this picture. I say, okay, I'll buy it, I like the tree. And uh, that winter, uh, I started making some cuts. You can see cut paste here and there. And I was looking at it and it was looking like it was going to go in the direction of a, of a, a kind of like a, an informal upright of, of sorts. And I was kind of playing around with it uh, for, I don't know, I can't, can't remember. It was maybe a couple of years and I was just becoming really bored with it because it was just, to me, it was just kind of an average piece of material. It wasn't that interesting. So I 
again, I had a couple of routes, right? Can I just put in the landscape, just sell it, or, or, or if I were to keep it, what can I do with it? So I had an idea about uh, creating a twin trunk design out of this material. So in order to do that, um, I needed to get material from this same tree in order to create my second trunk. Um, and uh, the way I went about it, it was to air layer one to one of the air, one of the branches. In this case was this lower branch right here. And you'll see a detail of that. So that's being air layer in order to, in the future, I'm going to make that branch um, a new second trunk. This is a close up of the air layer. And you can see some of the uh, roots already developing in the bag. And this is a picture of the tree with the air layer removed. Again, this is a process that didn't obviously happen overnight. This was maybe through the co course of uh, uh, you know uh, entire growing season. Uh, by the way, this is this is great uh, thing about uh, specifically about Japanese maples is that you can perform a lot of these techniques within one one growing season. Like root grafting, I've done it within one uh, growing season. Uh, certainly, air layering. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have done it uh, within eight to 10 weeks, you can, you can uh, uh, do an air layer. Uh, so you can do a lot of this stuff fairly quickly with Japanese maples. Other deciduous species, very different, like beech, very different. Uh, elm, pretty easy, but Japanese maples, pff, uh, really, I mean, very, very quick. You can, you can do a lot of the stuff. This is a detail of the uh, air layer branch. I put it in a pot. This was, I think, August, I believe, of that year. And uh, I left it all alone until the following spring. And my idea was to, I was going to approach graft this branch into the parent trunk to create a twin trunk design. And this is what I did. Uh, so the trunk, uh, all of a sudden, it, uh, you may say, well, what happened to the trunk? I thought it was like, up. all right, this was just simply a matter of changing the uh, planting angle or not planting, I was just said the, the uh, just the front of it. Uh, I wanted to create more of an elegant uh, line all the way up. And here is my grafted uh, branch that is gonna become my future trunk. Uh, you may wonder what this little thing here, this is, was a root graft that I was doing at the, at the same time. Uh, this was like two years later, I believe. Uh, you can see how much more developed the tree is getting. And uh, you may notice again that that graft has taken, is doing very well, is now uh, extending, uh, which is a great sign that is thriving. And that that union that, uh, you know, where the two the, the, uh, of, um, of the approach graph has fused together. I'm gonna show you a detail of that in a second. Uh, this is another couple of years after, and you can see how much more developed the tree is getting, including that second trunk. This is a close up of that union, uh, of the graft union right there. And you can see, this is about two years after, and you can see how well fused that is to the uh, parent, parent trunk. This is the back of the tree. Um, again, showing the entire uh, branch. I left this, what I call this crawling branch here that I, I, I'm, I'm, I, now I look at it and I consider that more than a branch, more like kind of like a trunk in a way, and it sits way back in the composition. It gives the whole thing a lot of depth. So that's why I kept it. A lot of people said, why, why did I keep it? Why didn't I cut it right at this junction here? But I felt like it gave the tree uh, just that extra, uh, you know, character, if you will, something unexpected. Uh, this is a tree in the fall. It tends to get beautiful colors. Uh, sometimes it goes from red to like in this case this year or, or that year when I photographed that was yellow orange. And this is a tree last spring. Uh, so you can see how, you know, the, the overall canopy 
has uh, developed uh, quite well, including the uh, that second trunk. And this is uh, this was a bit of a longer period uh, process. So uh, what is that? 13, uh, 13 years more or less, uh, if my math is correct, between the, the two uh, images. So again, with these sort of techniques, you can kind of reimagine, if you will, uh, your your material. Where what's your what's your plan moving forward with this? Any design concepts? Push it more to the right or clear some more branches for the smaller ones growing in? Or what's yeah, the that's that's a good question. Uh, I do. I I think that now you know. Funny that you asked me that because I was just looking at that tree today, and I actually I think I am going to remake some of those branches. So all to say that I, I and I I'm almost. It's almost painful for me to to say this, only because, you know, it has taken me so so long to develop some of the branches. But I became dissatisfied with some of that structure here and there. I'm gonna cut those branches back quite further back and remake remake some of those. Uh, one of the things too, I want to create also a little more of an e an even, uh, more asymmetrical in and out kind of uh, canopy uh, for me in, in certain ways, it's a little bit even. And yeah, to that point, to your point that you just made, I, I'm, I need to clear um, some of the branching in order to allow that second trunk of, of sorts to kind of develop further. Um, where am I going with this apex wise? Um, I, I don't know yet. Uh, I, I, I kind of go back and forth between just swinging back to the right and sometimes just keeping it going to the left. So I, I don't know. I can't answer that because I'm, I'm still a little bit undecided. But, but even beyond that, I, I think that what I'm going to do next spring is I am going to, uh, I am going to cut back some of those branches quite drastically in order to remake some of those lines. Uh, I'm focusing kind, kind of on the, uh, the development of the Nabari on this tree. Um, it's yeah. quite uh, dramatic, the, the, the Nabari from the original to the uh, current tree. Did you, yes. do, did you do a lot of um, maybe did thread grafting for roots on this? Yes. Yes, uh, I, so the, the answer is, is a little bit um, uh, kind of twofold. Um, on, in the picture on the left, that, that, um, that nebari was a little bit hidden, okay? So I had some of that already there, uh, but also in the process of, you know, and, I, and I'm sure you guys all do this, every time you repot, right, you want to take all the bottom growing branches, branches, sorry, uh, roots, cut them down all the way almost to the bottom of the trunk and let those lateral roots develop. So that was part of the process. That's a pro part of the process that a lot of us are familiar with. And on top of that, I did a lot of uh, root grafting that, it, by the way, in this photo doesn't show, but I did do, um, it has now, about, I think, four or five uh, other root grafts in there. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, again, it's a process of just trying to, to kind of improve that Nebari gradually. Um, interesting enough, I hear a lot lately about in the last couple of years where people, uh, they use um, a, a technique uh, where you actually put the tree on a board and then you, you kind of screw it to a board in order to flatten out and, and, and you know, your, your Nebari. And that's, a, that's definitely a great technique. It was um, sort of pioneered by a Bihara, Japanese guy, just complete sort of mad scientist as far as coming with techniques and stuff. Like that. I'm gonna show you one of those techniques in a little bit. Um, but I wanna also say to you guys that um, as, as, as good as technique that is, I think that also, I, I think people tend to think, okay, the only, the only way I can create a great Nibari is by using that board. And if that is not true, what is true is like consistent work on that, on that root system. Every time you repot, every two or three years, be on top of it, make sure that every, any crossing roots you, you, you kind of fix or you cut back or whatnot. Uh, so is that consistent 
uh, technique applied time and time again that eventually will give you a beautiful flare in the body and not so much, okay, I'm gonna put the, the tree on a board and in like five years, I'm gonna have a beautiful Nevari. It doesn't work that way. Um, so I just wanted to kind of say that because uh, I, I feel like lately people are like nothing talking, uh, you know, about about that technique quite a bit. And, uh, and I wanna, I guess in a way dispel the fact that it's like, that's almost like that's not the only way to create a, a good Nibari. It's just good technique, good persistent technique, time and time again, that will give you uh, the best results, I think in the, in the end, in the long run. Sergio, a little food for thought on the design of this. I could see the defining branch and the apex going to the left and then having a little bit of upward movement incorporated into it to mimic the thread graphs on the bottom right, I think would look stellar. So you're saying, sure. So you're saying, let me, let me try to understand you on the apex, you're uh, saying going left, right? As it is now, but with a little bit more movement up. All the branches on the left side, I think could have a slight little bit of movement and growth up. I really like what you have going on with those thread graphs. They kind of move up and out. And so yeah. to incorporate that on the left side and then push the whole thing to the left really hard, which opens up more room for the right side thread graphs, I think would look amazing. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, cool, cool. I'll definitely, I'll definitely consider that for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's been, uh, it's been a, a long process for this tree, for sure. Okay, I'm going to show you guys uh, root grafting. So this is my patient, uh, Japanese maple, that um, you'll see here what my issue was. This was uh, the groove that you see here was oh, from my uh, previous failed root graft. And uh, I was using that groove once again to retry my root graft a second time. And uh, you can see how a root graft, a root will greatly improve this area because I had nothing here. All right, in order to do that, I rescore the, uh, the edge of that groove in order to expose the cambium layer. And you can see here in, in uh, this light green. And uh, ideally for root graft, uh, you, you probably wanna perform it when you're doing uh, repotting only because the, the root system becomes much more easily accessible. Uh, in this case, I, that year I wanted to do the root graft, but I did not need uh, uh, the tree, the, the tree did not need to be repotted. So what I did was just cut out a pie shaped uh, area in the soil in order to accommodate the future uh, root system of the seedling that I was going to uh, graft. Uh, this is a close-up of my ceiling, and you can see here the top root itself is a, is is the root that eventually is going to be formed part of uh, of the surface root. A uh, close-up of me trying the the ceiling uh, for for just fit, making sure that it fits really snug in there. Uh, when you do your root grafts, you don't want something to be loose. You don't want your groove that you cut too wide. Again, the, the diameters need to match fairly closely. So it's, uh, that's the only thing with, with grafting, with all types of grafting. You have to be fairly precise with all this work and, and, and relatively clean in the way you approach uh, these, uh, these techniques. Um, after I, I'm you know, satisfied with the way that ceiling fits in that groove, in fact, it fits so snug that you may notice that I crush some of the surface of that bark. Uh, again, no damage to that. That actually is actually even better. And it just uh, assures me that it, that is a really snug fit in there. I use a push pin or uh, they also sell what they call these grafting um, uh, nails. And either one has worked well for me. Um, and uh, in this case, I'm not driving the push pin through the ceiling, but just to the parent trunk, to the base of, the, of that trunk. And, and the edge of that push pin is what holds the ceiling in place. It is critical that in, uh, in um, root grafting, uh, 
uh, that that seedling, that union stays very uh, secure and it does not wobble or it's not loose. Otherwise, it's likely to fail. Afterwards, I put cut paste and I to keep uh, dirt and, and water uh, away from the area and to aid in the healing process of that uh, union. And uh, again, you can see here uh, that root that again, is gonna form part of my nebari. Uh, wiring the, uh, the ceiling sometimes becomes important and it has nothing to do with aesthetics, it has everything to do with pushing out that ceiling away from the canopy because once, once that tree flushes out and is full of leaves, that little ceiling sitting inside of that canopy will surely die. Uh, so you obviously do not want that to happen. So sometimes it's necessary to wire that ceiling uh, out, uh, out of the canopy so that it can receive enough light and air so that it can, it can uh, uh, thrive. And you can see here at the bottom uh, how I fit uh, the, the, root, it's the root ball within the pie shape uh chunk that i cut out out of the the uh the you know the original root ball out and here is uh, uh you know everything is completed the tree is back in its spot and this is oh actually this is a different tree i wanted to show you something that i failed to photograph at the time that i was doing the the other tree this is a trident and what i do is once i I uh, confirmed that the, uh, you know, the ceiling has fused with the base of the, uh, of the parent trunk. I don't cut it flush with the, um, with the nabari. I actually leave a little stump as you see in here and I let it die back naturally. And afterwards, maybe several months, if not a year, I cut it and then I make my final cut, much like you would cut a branch you make your cut and then you put cut paste and that will heal over nicely. But I don't, I, I don't uh, go right away and make my final cut. I just let it, let it just die back naturally. I wanted to kind of show that, that, that this particular one was done on a trident and back to the original Japanese maple. And here is my grafted root right here. This is two years after it was grafted. So you can see how that area got improved by adding a, a, a root there. And it can get very addictive, right? Because we can argue that, okay, I can put another one here and I can put another one here. So you can go on and on and on with, with, the, um, with your root grafting. It can get kind of addicting, uh, but it's a great way to fix a fairly decent nebari. I, I know that I have, um, I have some folks that have brought trees to me with crazy looking nebari and say, well, we'll do some root grafting and that, that will fix it. No that when, when, when roots are that far gone, the only solution is to air layer that tree and start all over again. Uh, but when you have a very decent nebari, you can, you can increase the quality by doing some, some, uh, some grafting in it. By the way, this is not the only way, uh, way to do it, right? This is an approach graft, technically it's an approach graft, uh, but some folks perform a thread graft for roots. Uh, you may have seen, uh, I think Ryan Neal did it uh, on a, one of his live stream. I, I believe he did thread grafting uh, instead of approach grafting. And that's certainly another, uh, you know, uh, way to, to, to do root, graft, root, uh, root grafts. <clears throat> okay, any, any questions on, on the root grafting? Okay, uh, closing wounds. This is uh, a trident maple, uh, about um, 11 or 12 inches tall. And um, at the back of it, <clears throat> when I purchased it, I, I didn't realize it because it was full of leaves. And at the back of it, I uh, had this big, big scar. And somewhere, I don't know who, put uh, this sort of latex-like uh, substance over the wound and somehow it never protected the, the, the wound and it, it rotted, the entire area was rotted. Now, I don't know if you, some of you have noticed that any tree that has rotted wood 
the economy will will stall, will not will not roll over basically, or very very slowly. It will not effectively roll over uh, what is essentially rotted wood. So you need to give the tree a stable surface. It doesn't the tree doesn't care whether it's its own wood or whether it's like you know healing over concrete. It needs to be the point being is that it needs to be a very stable surface. So going back to the area, this is the back of the tree. Uh, you can see the, the, uh, when I cleaned out the, the whole area and I took that latex-like uh, substance, the tree was all, had a huge cavity, was all rotted, and it was weird. It had this, this growth, this lip that was going upwards. Uh, the whole thing was just a mess. Uh, so I decided to kind of clean all that up. And um, here's my, my Dremel. Uh, so I went in there and I cleaned all the, uh, all that, punky wood out, making sure that I, I went all the way to where I felt, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of hit uh, more solid wood, that it was more stable. So I want to make sure that I, the whole area was cleaned out. Uh, afterwards, I use uh, compressed air to just, you know, get all the debris out of there, all the dust, making sure that the whole area is very clean. Uh, and then the next step, and you can see how large that cavity is. The next step was to score the edge of that because that promotes uh, the, the uh, cadmium uh, layer to kind of start rolling over once again. It just get, it's almost like kickstarting the, the, uh, the cadmium layer. After that, uh, I use in Japan, I believe that traditional they've used concrete uh, in these modern times, I uh, think more and more people are using uh, two-part epoxy. That's what I use, and it works great. You can buy this at any Home Depot or Lowe's. And uh, when you mix it together, just wear gloves because it's just this nasty chemical. And when you mix the two parts together, it dries to like, uh, like rock hard. So here I am mixing the two. And I, uh, here's a picture of the whole cavity filled up. And now when you do it, obviously you need to be very careful because you need to sort of do enough so that it follows the contour of the, of the trunk line basically. So it doesn't, it, you know, you don't wanna do it in a way where it's got a big bulge or a depression. You wanna make sure that that follows almost the trunk line so that when the camion rolls over, it all looks nice and, and even and feels like it's all part of the, uh, of the, of the you know, of continuation of the trunk line, basically. This is another shot of the entire thing completed. And then one more step to that is actually, oh, sorry. So I'm uh, here, I'm rescoring again the edge of that. And the next step is just to cover with cut paste to cover that area and promote the healing process. And uh, that's essentially uh, at least one of the ways that I know of uh, to close very, very large wounds. Again, if you have a case on a tree where you're, you're, you know, there's a wound that is not closing properly, is completely stalled, uh, look into it because most likely that wood is probably rotted. Any questions on, on, on this uh, technique? Okay, last but not least, stay here with me for a little more guys, we're almost done. Okay, this was... Uh, this was uh, an Ebihara, once again, mad genius Japanese guy that invented this technique and he has haunted me for a long time. Some, most people call it peg grafting, I call it relocation uh, grafting. Basically uh, the, the, what it is is like, and maybe you guys have heard about this, is how do you take a branch from one section of the tree that you might not need and you reuse that branch and reposition it to another part of the tree. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, obviously this is a, a multi-trunk uh, Japanese maple, uh, fairly large material that I am in the process of uh, rebuilding essentially. And one of the techniques that I wanted to try was this, again, so-called peg, graf 
peg grafting, and you'll see why it's called peg grafting. Uh, the green arrow is showing a section of a branch that I do not need on that part of the tree. And I'm gonna use that section of the branch and move it over here to the where the red arrow is pointing. Um, when I bought this tree, unfortunately, it was it came from Japan, and uh, for whatever reasons, it had another uh, trunk, and it died back. Uh, this became then my main trunk, and unfortunately, this main trunk had barely any any branching uh, uh, left. Uh, so you can see how the other other trunks had more developed branching and et cetera. But this guy, uh, I needed to ba basically repopulate the entire trunk with, uh, with branching. So one of the branches that I wanted to do was this uh, peg, so-called peg grafting. Um, you may also notice this green pot here. This is another thing that I'm, I'm trying here, which is a thread graft. So that's another thing that, I, that this tree's got going uh, right now. Uh, so we're not going to focus on this. We're going to focus on the on the peg graft. Next spring. Uh, so how do we do that, right? Uh, so how we go about it is to um, uh, graft a seedling, Japanese seedling, uh, on the branch that you want to remove. Uh, essentially, because you want that seedling to eventually feed that branch and not and not be fed right not be sustained by by its original source which is the the parent trunk you want that branch then to uh make, you know reroute the the uh the you know uh the the water source uh from the parent trunk to the seedling so i needed to graft that so here's my pot the light pot is where i'm and don't worry i'm going to show you some close-ups of that in a second uh jumping off a few months into september i am ready to remove that branch and i'm going to show you some close-ups of how i did that here's my close-up uh this is my ceiling whoops uh, just through here one second uh, here's my ceiling right in here, uh, grafted. I, I did an approach graft. And here is my branch. He, this is the branch that I'm going to use. And uh, I, I did the, uh, the graft uh, through using uh, uh, grafting tape. And I used wire to just hold the whole thing together. Uh, it took about three months for that to, to fuse together. Uh, and now I'm ready to kind of remove the entire thing. And you can see a close up here of how well it fused the whole thing, grafted. So I am ready to now remove it. Now, again, now this branch, right, that was originally fed by the parent tree, now it's being fed also by the trunk of the seedling that I grafted. I am ready now to remove that branch. And I'm going to leave myself a section at the base of it, and you'll see why I need to uh, I need uh, to cut off and, and leave myself about an inch or two at the base of that of that branch. This is the branch removed, grafted with the seedling. Here is a close up of it. Again, about an inch left on that base of the. This is the branch that I'm going to relocate. Okay, and this is my seedling. Now, at this point, I do not need the rest of the ceiling. So I'm going to cut it off. Okay. And here's my branch being supported by that ceiling. A schematic that I did just to kind of explain the concept, hopefully a little bit more clearly. Here is the ceiling grafted. Uh, but here is the, the, the whole concept. That base that I'm leaving here that you can see, I am going to I am going to carve eventually a peg that is going to go in a pre-drill hole in the new location, okay? And the green section, it represents the life area of that branch where it's going to graft in the new location. Uh, here's about two or three weeks later after I removed it, just to show you guys that it was surviving and it was doing fine, the branch. 
Uh, this was getting close to the very late uh, summer. So that's why you see some leaf burn and stuff like that. But otherwise, the branch is, is doing really well. And uh, the dark section here with cut paste is showing the new uh, selected uh, location for, for, the, for that uh, grafted branch. Jumping off uh, to the following spring, and this was this past spring of, uh, this was, uh, I believe, late March of 2021 of this year. And here is my, my, my peg. So I carved that by hand carefully, okay? And this is the area that is going to be inserted in the, um, in the trunk. Uh, okay, so, all right, so here, shows you the pre-drill hole on the new location. And this is where the peg is gonna be inserted. Now, the edge of this, this is a live, right? This is my cambium. And this is where it's gonna fuse with the, uh, with the live part of my, of my relocated branch. And here is the whole procedure done. Uh, it is inserted. I put cut paste around that cut and I fasten the whole thing very securely with wire to make sure that it does not move whatsoever. And uh, although I don't have pictures of that, I, I, have, um, I have checked it. This was obviously uh, early spring. Uh, it did, the branch grew very well through the entire growing season. And I believe from what I've seen when I removed the cut paste, about a month and a half ago that I, I believe that it has fused all around it, uh, but I think it's, it's gonna require a little more time. And here's a far view of the grafted uh, branch right in here, okay? And what's tricky about it is that uh, the pitch of your hole needs to be kind of correct because if you do it in the wrong angle, that branch will end up looking downwards, which will not follow the, the general sort of direction or the growth pattern of the, of the rest of the canopy. So you have to be a little careful or mindful of a few things when doing this technique. It requires a certain amount of precision, and, uh, uh, but it's really fascinating. And uh, the point of using this technique is because you may have and, and you know, many times I realize that we may not have the, the right sort of uh, tree to do this, but if you have a tree that you have a branch that is, that is 10, 15, 20 years old, and you wanna cut it because you don't need it for the design, but it's a kind of a shame to just cut it off and throw it out, right? You might repurpose that branch somewhere else in that tree. So that's the value of this technique uh, as opposed to doing a thread graft like you're seeing here, where yeah, I can do a thread graft, much easier to do, right? But I'm gonna require, all my, I don't know, another five to eight years to really develop that branch. So immediately you almost have a finished branch there. Now, I'll admit that when I did this, um, I had to cut the, the branch quite a bit um, without getting into too much detail. If, if anybody was paying attention, this was here. This was my original uh, uh, location, but all of a sudden you find the graft here. What happened was when I uh, looked at the area and I removed the cut paste, that area was not closed completely. So that would have been a, just a bad decision to do that graft there because it was not healed properly. So I, uh, f you know, I, I did not, uh, I had to basically select a, a new area because that would not work well. So I selected another area for it. Uh, and, that's, and that's why you see it all of a sudden in a different, in a different location. Uh, and because of that, I needed to shorten out that branch a lot more. So I ended up using a much shorter branch than the original one that I had. So it was a little bit of a shame, but at the very, le at the very least, I have the base of that branch, most of the branches, it feels kind of old and, and uh, has nice, nice movement to it. So at least I was able to use part of it um, for, for this, uh, you know, for, for my design. So anyway, and I believe that's, that's it, uh, guys. So if you wanna see more of my work, 
uh, please visit me at uh, m5bonsai.works.com uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of, you know, more, more work in my website. Uh, and I uh, thank you very much, but I don't know if you guys have any questions on the pet grafting. I'll be glad to take any questions on that or anything else. How did you make the hole for the peg? Uh, with a drill, a drill. And I had to make sure that the diameter of that, of that, my bed, my drill bed was, uh, you know, was the right, basically the right diameter uh, for, for my, for the peg that I had made or pretty close to it. I have a question on the thread graft that you did on that tree. Uh, where did you get the material? Is that a, did you air layer a branch off of that tree for the thread graft or did yes. you use cuttings? No, okay. Yes, it was an air layer from this tree. Clearly needed to be material taken from this tree because otherwise you end up with different leaf shape, leaf color, et cetera, et cetera. Even different bark quality. So I needed to, uh, so originally it was a uh, air layer piece from this tree. From this tree. Yeah. Yeah, that I grew and then I, I thread graft a piece of it, um, you know, through the trunk. I've noticed too on a lot of your Japanese maples, the bark is almost like just white, white, white. Do you, is that just the natural or is that do you treat it with lime sulfur or something like that? Yeah, some cases um, I have in this case, like I think it, this was some, uh, an effect of the photography. If I may, let me go back real quick here to uh, the spring shot. Uh, it looks pretty white, but no, not in this case. So yeah, basically in some cases I do use lime sulfur. Uh, other cases I do not. It just depends sometimes, uh, essentially. Yeah, in here. No, that's that's really just a factor. Just the, the fact that you know that 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 uh, bark is uh, all grayed out and and whatnot, and uh, and taken with a night, it just gives you the effect that it's, 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 white, it's very white. But this was not treated. This wood was not treated. This bark was not treated. All the ones that you've seen previously, some of them they were in fact treated with lime sulfur. Um, I find lime sulfur to be aesthetically, uh, I, 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 you know, for me, it's a good thing, particularly if you're showing a tree uh, in winter, like a Japanese maple. What it is, is that, and they do that in Japan, uh, basically it, it's to even out the color throughout the entire tree, because as you can see here, you have this gray bark, but then you have this green, bright green, uh, younger branches and the lime sulfur tends to even out the whole thing uh, more. And, uh, and I, for, the mo for the most part, that's the reason why I use it is for aesthetic reasons. Um, I do know that people use it as a fungicide as well, which is great, uh, but I, I think mainly I, I use it for aesthetic reasons once in a while, not every time. What, what, the, what dilution do you use? What dilution? Uh, it's, it's a, I think it's about, um, I think sometimes half and half, but I think I've gone even as strong, strong as like three quarters lime sulfur to uh, three, you know, to one part um, uh, water. water. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, it, my solution changes a little bit, but sometimes a little bit stronger than others. Okay. You have to be careful, by the way, uh, with lime sulfur. Uh, if the leaves are just like, even the buds are just kind of uh, advanced enough in, in, in when they push in the spring and, and you spray them, uh, my experience is that you can burn uh, those, those leaves. Um, they, it has a just kind of like, um, not, not uh, you know, I, it definitely has a kind of like a bad effect basically to those uh, do those buds are, are coming out in the spring. So you have to usually, it's either now or, or in the middle of winter, uh, but don't wait too, too, too long uh, because it, it can affect the, I think the, uh, the buds uh, negatively. What yeah. kind of drill bit did you use that you got such a clean cut on that borehole? Uh, uh, you're talking about the drill hole? Yes, what kind of drill did you use? Because oh, I just, I just use a cheap, uh, I have, um, 
uh, I think my my is a Ryobi, uh, one of those you know uh, Ryobi uh, drills, not nothing special. And the drill bit itself is from Ryobi too. Uh, I'm just trying to just kind of advance this to uh, yeah yeah. And I did it very at a very slow speed to make sure that you know I uh, my 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 car was pretty pretty clean or as clean as possible. Um, yeah, but but yeah, yeah it, was, it was nothing special. Nothing special, I would it say. It looks so clean. You know, most most of the times when I drill into the wood like that, the fibers, you know, you see the fibers uh, around yeah. where you drill, but yours, it looks so clean. I think I think I attribute that to doing it at a very slow speed. Like I, I did it very, very slowly. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, afterwards, if there was any fibers, I would come in with a razor blade. And I would just kind of make sure that it was like nice and clean, you know what I mean? But um, but yeah, I, I think it was just uh, uh, again it, at the speed that I that I drilled that into the wood was um, was fairly slow speed into it, and uh, you know to try to get uh, again as clean a, a cut as as I possibly could. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Well, Sergio, this has been a phenomenal program, um, just beyond what I expected. Your vision and your artistic skill and your ability to see the trees in a, uh, in a different way is just amazing. It's quite a gift. Absolutely. World class. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yes, no, very, very inspirational, I must say. Thank you, guys. I, I yes. really do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you guys have been uh, an awesome, awesome audience, and I appreciate all the uh, all the uh, great questions and feedback and whatnot. Uh, again, uh, it's been a pleasure for me to uh, to have the opportunity to present to you guys tonight. Thank you.